So the, what, the way how it should be requirements, then solutions, and then architecture. Okay. This is what you have. Yeah. Okay. So that it stays. It stays as it was initially. Okay. Because Matthew thought that it's a bit awkward in the sense that we have requirements, architecture, and solutions. But Daniel actually commented in slides that it has requirements and solutions, and then the architecture how it fits in. It. He prefers that way. So it's all fine. It's basically reversed as it was today in the morning. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Agnes. Okay, welcome to MVO3. We get uh, get get going, please. Um, my name is uh, Matthew Botches. Sam Aldrin, in my chair, and we have uh, Ignis Van um who's uh, our secretary. Okay, here is the the note. Well, I'm just uh, I apologise for the tiny font. We'll we'll bring opera glasses next time. Okay, so blue sheets. So there's two sets of blue sheets going around, one down each side of the room. Please, uh, please fill it in when it when it reaches you. Um, note takers. So we've got Ignis doing the doing the minutes, uh, and Tal's doing a volunteer to be Jabber scribe. Thank you very much to both of those. Right. This is um, this is the first normal meeting we've had in a while. Uh, so we've got not got, you, as you if you've been to the previous ITFs, you'll be aware we've had this. Uh, Experiment running where we've been doing some round tables and um, on different topics and We've had some success with that that's generated some drafts in the security area So we're now going to focus this meeting mostly actually on those security drafts um, But we do have a really packed agenda. So please if you're presenting uh, Keep to your time slot um, Otherwise, we're really gonna have to cut you off. Thank you Okay, so the agenda um, Any comments on the agenda? One other thing we have in, in, in this meeting um, towards the end of the agenda is um, in order to help set some context maybe for some more control plane work, we asked um, Jorge to give us an overview of the EVPN work in BES that's relevant to NVO3. So he's got a short slot to talk about that later on. Okay, so milestones. So we haven't updated these for a bit. Um, the chairs will, will go in and discuss these. I think probably we, we ought to update them again. It's about time. Uh, document status. So um, we have one new RFC, 8151, which is the use cases for DCBPNs. Uh, nothing in the RFC editor's queue at the moment. Uh, the multicast framework draft went through last call, and we did publication requests, so that's with Alia now. Um, and the other two documents of note is that we um, adopted the, um, actually there's a, a, a typo on the, a slide here. Uh, one of these drafts is the design team document for uh, the data plane encapsulation. So that was adopted. And there's also a draft Geneva that is um, adopted. Thank you. Okay, the other, the other thing that we tried to do, uh, we ran an adoption poll for two OEM drafts that were the output of the uh, routing area OEM design team. That's re regarding the overlay OEM header and um, CC and C on demand CC and CV um, for overlay networks. There wasn't really consensus to adopt the drafts, um, but the chairs, you know, we need to make some kind of progress in this OEM area. So the chairs have asked the protagonists on this to work together to try and resolve their issues. Um, and generate some more discussion on the list uh, to try and move forward with the, in the OEM space. Okay, thanks. So, one other thing I should mention is that we do have one, we will have one remote um, 
remote session from Elango for a draft Geneva update. So we're going to try and do that through MeTeco in a moment. So I think first up on the agenda is um, Sammy with the design encapsulation design team. Yeah, good afternoon. Sammy, you have uh, the front screen. Oh, do you want to? Uh, do you want this as well? This is easier. Okay. So yeah, this is an update for uh, the design team in Cap Draft. So uh, uh, yeah, since last update, the draft became our group draft, as Matthew mentioned here. So uh, I'm going to be discussing mainly the changes that went to uh, uh, the draft. OK. So uh, we did a couple of removal here. We removed uh, the backward compatibility to VXLAN as a requirement. Uh, there were uh, those, uh, yeah, those updates uh, were to reflect the comments that were sent on the list and many, many discussions that happened on this draft uh, over the NVO3 list. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we removed the backward compatibility as a requirement to VXLAN. Um, the other thing we removed is uh, issues with extending the bit, bit flags uh, that was under GU as well in the draft. Uh, then uh, the following changes are uh, more addition or clarification to the document. Uh, so, uh, for example, we uh, uh, added a recommendation for the control plane. Uh, to have the working group work uh, on a draft for guidance on how control plane would uh, uh, would help in option processing uh, and as well ordering and uh, um, uh, option size, the next protocols that could be signaled with Geneva using control plane. So the control plane participation in general was that this is a dynamic or a centralized control plane. Uh, as well, uh, uh, we clarified the transit node rule. Uh, so what kind of option uh, will be processed uh, by the transit node? So uh, we uh, clarified that only a subset of option here will be uh, looked at by the transit node. Uh, uh, one more thing as well we clarified uh, was a uh, uh, statement we made about how uh, uh, different software modules uh, on the device, on the VTAP itself, uh, can handle different options. Uh, like Mac learning and security uh, uh, options that could exist uh, on uh, after the Geneva tunnel header, right? So uh, for the recommendation section, which was the main section uh, on which we discussed uh, uh, why we recommended Geneva and so on, uh, we added some more uh, as well uh, uh, statement or more uh, points uh, uh, regarding Geneva. So uh, how Geneva is used today in production, especially the Geneva options, uh, is how hardware as well uh, is currently supporting Geneva tunnel, uh, Geneva TLVs uh, uh, parsing. Uh, as well, <clears throat> we clarified uh, how the design team addressed some usage model uh, while considering the requirement, uh, uh, you know, uh, for uh, the implementation of Geneva and option. Uh, for both software and hardware. Uh, there were a few clarifications as well uh, that we made for a uh, statement we had in the recommendation about early bit assignment. Uh, this was related to the going cap, so we clarified that too uh, on how um, we, uh, how a processing for an option uh, that could be in an extension uh, for uh, uh, a bit extension for GU. Uh, will be processed, and I think you can look up the explanation in the draft. Uh, as well, we added some classification, sorry, some clarification uh, about uh, uh, the requirement to uh, to address variable lengths and different subtypes uh, from where this requirement came. So we added clarifications that this came from OEM and as well came from some security extension. Uh, we added more clarification on the OEM aspect because there were some requirements made from OEM uh, about alternate marking. 
uh, and the need of two beds. And I think recently there were some discussion uh, about how can we live with one bed instead of two. So, uh, so I think that OEM in general uh, uh, usage uh, and usage models uh, justification need to be uh, discussed more. Uh, so there was some discussion about uh, removing or, or uh, repurposing the current OEM bit in the Geneva header. And uh, so, so we need to, uh, I think as Matthew mentioned, to, to talk more about how OEM uh, can be uh, addressed uh, in general and how will that impact the Geneva tunnel, right? Uh, we recommended for Geneva to follow the fragmentation recommendations that was made for PUI. Uh, for both layer two and layer three VPN as well. Uh, and uh, we gave the section from uh, the PUI document here uh, that discuss how fragmentation should be handled. There were some discussion as well on the critical bit on uh, uh, the Geneva uh, draft. And, uh, uh, you know, and we, we recommended to have some text uh, on how critical bits can be used with uh, control plane specifying the critical options. So, so there was some, some discussion on that and the things in the Geneva document, Ilang will as well be addressing uh, some of the comments here, including this one, uh, that we, or some of the recommendations that we made in the design team in CAP document. Uh, we as well uh, added uh, for the telemetry option, uh, uh, a recommendation for a use case that require 256 byte uh, uh, option on a, in a single TLV. Uh, there was no consensus uh, to uh, extend the single TLV lens to 256, but uh, I believe further discussion is needed on that aspect. Uh, so, so that change as well will require some discussions that we need to do uh, with the Geneva uh, tunnel in cap or with the Geneva uh, authors, right? Uh, we uh, finally a couple of things here which changed uh, the DTLS reference uh, in the DT in CAP document, replace it uh, with uh, uh, IPsec and DTLS. So not only um, uh, you know uh, mentioning that DTLS is the only way of providing security, protection, and integrity here. Uh, so uh, IPsec, ESP, and EH can be used too. Um, so as well, and we finally recommended, of course, the work group to work more on security option for Geneva and uh, how those can be addressed. So uh, I think with that, uh, yeah, with that, I think those are the changes we made or we addressed in the document, uh, the work group document, uh, the IETF and VO3 in CAP document. Uh, but as well, there were some more do uh, more comments that uh, and discussion happening uh, now on the list, on the mailing list, and we'll be updating that in the next version. Uh, discussion were related to uh, the calculation of the entropy, uh, as well, some discussion were related about traversing NAT uh, or doing some SNAT. So those uh, are some of the discussions that's happening on the list. So we'll probably address those comments and may add more sections to the document or may add more updates. So any comments? Hi, Tom is Rahim Arvel. Uh, I'm a co-author of this draft, so I have a question which is more intended to the chairs. Um, so now this is a working group document. I guess it means the recommendations are adopted by the working group. Um, and at this point, VXLAN GP is still a standard track draft. Uh, so my question is regarding the future of VXLAN GP. Is there a future? And if so, when will the recommendations uh, come into effect? Thanks. So I think when we, what we said when we had, um, chartered the design team, um, and when the design team came up with a recommendation for Geneva was that the other, the other encapsulation drafts um, would have to wait for Geneva to be um, sent to the ISG, adopted, to, uh, right? And then following that, so when the working group is basically done with Geneva, we can progress. If, if people want to progress as an informational document or experimental, we have yet to determine the exact um, status of it. Uh, you know, the other, the other drafts like the BXN GPA. 
Um, I think there's some changes that need to be made, for example, to the VXLAN GP draft anyway at the moment. For example, it's obviously, it says standards track on it, and we've said it won't be standards track. Um, but the way it requests an IANA allocation is um, only valid for standards track documents. It wants standards action. Um, so there's a few things we'll have to fix in, in the draft um, to make it appropriate if, if that's what you want to progress. Uh, yeah. Greg KZD. Um, so in your view, are uh, there open questions that uh, were uh, mentioned listed in um, uh, data plane uh, design team presentation, how they related to the progress of Genevieve document? They are being addressed in the Geneva document. Elango has a presentation now on Geneva uh, to discuss how those are being addressed. Yeah, so Elango is going to present, so you may want to ask the question at that time. Because, because one of their open questions, I believe, that uh, are related to OEM and uh, Correct, yeah. bit use. So again, I, I don't expect uh, the answer now, but just I'm saying that um, that needs to be clear. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, all the recommendation and all the uh, uh, comments that was put on Geneva uh, are going to be being are being addressed. Uh, you know, because some of those things are still discussions, right? So cannot be addressed after the discussion concludes, right? Okay. Thanks. Any more comments? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so, so next is Elango. Hopefully this is going to work. Um, I think you need to go to the mic. Elango? What's going on here? I think uh, Elango has to join the mic queue. Yeah, he's on here. Oh, yes? Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Elango, can you hear us? He can't respond. He has to come to the mic. Yeah, you need to come to the mic, Elango. Okay, if this doesn't work because we've got a very tight agenda, I think Sam is going to do it, right? I think we need to go ahead. Yeah. Okay, sure. So, so yeah, uh, I, I'm doing uh, this presentation on behalf of Bilango. This is uh, yeah, Elango, sorry, uh, and this is a uh, Geneva uh, in draft or Geneva tunnel. Are you able to hear me? Are you able to hear me? Oh, oh, I can hear you now. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. First of all, yeah. thank you for the IETF and uh, the meeting organizers for uh, providing me the remote presentation opportunity. Um, so I'm going to cover the draft uh, Geneva update. Um, this uh, we are closely coordinating with the um, with the design team, so that uh, you know the questions that were asked in the previous session, um, I'd be addressing this uh, uh, during this uh, presentation. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Okay. Yes. Uh, so this is a recap of the draft Jenny, um, you know, the, the previous version uh, when we did this update. And the update was based on the recommendations by the design team. And um, as Sami mentioned earlier, the first one of them uh, is the control plane uh, for the con constraints uh, for the options. Um, so what we did this one is this, this has been addressed in section 4.2.1. Um, where we stated that the control plane can limit the number of option TLVs and uh, TLV ordering, size of TLVs and what TLVs can be transmitted uh, between the um, uh, NVE endpoints. So all those um, uh, constraints were added uh, to this section and this helps the software as well as the hardware implementation of uh, the, um, the Geneve in the endpoints. Um, and also, if the control plane should have the ability to describe um, the supported TLVs uh, to the endpoints. Um, and also, we, we mentioned that you know, in the absence of the control plane, an alternate configuration mechanism may be used uh, for this purpose. And as I said, that you know, this, these things are, you know, all, all these text has been already included in the draft uh, in the current version in the 04. 
So let's move on to the next slide. OK. Yes. Um, so uh, after that, um, um, the changes, like further discussion uh, were happening in the mailing list, um, as well as some of these recommendations have been captured in um, the um, design team draft, the recent design team draft update. So I'm going to go over the recommendations here. The first one is the follow the recommendation um, a, for the overlay services like the PWE3 um, for the L2, L3 VPN. Um, the main objective for this request is to prevent uh, fragmentation. Um, so one of the ways this, uh, you know, the, the PW3 draft is addressing that one is, or, or the RFC is addressing that one is guaranteeing a larger MTU size for the tunnel overhead. Um, so we have a similar draft in section 4.1.1 in Geneva that outlines, you know, best practices for preventing the fragmentation. Um, pretty much the same uh, thing, like you know, increasing the MTU size in in the, in the sense um, so that uh, you know you don't have the fragmentation. And even if there is a fragmentation, that fragmentation should be done before um, the encapsulation part of it, so that you know the so that the packets um, or the frames don't get fragmented um, in transit. And the next one is the recommend to add the OAM consideration. And there are two uh, different discussions that came up as part of the OAM. One of them is the you know two bits for alternate marking for the performance measurements. And there was also another question related to do we really need the um, uh, is there a need for an OAM bit? And or if if so, then clarify the need for the OAM bit. And you know there are you know other OAM drafts available in there. And you know in general, I would say that the OAM proposals and use cases need uh, further discussion before we go ahead and make the changes. Um, if you look at the draft test, um, you know which talks about the OAM. The, in fact, uh, that draft suggests or the proposes the use of the existing OAM bit in order to disambiguate between you know OAM frames versus the the normal uh, data frames. And also you know the draft also proposes um, further. An OAM channel in order to carry the, uh, the OAM messages as well, and so um, th this is just an example. Um, but there are other proposals as well as on table. So we wanted to, you know, allow some time for the OAM uh, discussions to mature, and then based on that decision, then we will go ahead and then make any changes as needed. Uh, next slide, please. The okay. other one is the recommendation to provide additional text uh, in order to clarify the usage of the critical bit uh, processing. Um, uh, of course, a critical bit is helpful in options processing, um, both in software and hardware, and more specifically in hardware. So it, it allows uh, quickly to look at the critical options bit. And if the hardware is capable of processing the options, it will continue to process the options. And if it is not capable, it also allows the hardware to skip over the options and um, uh, and then process the rest of the payload uh, before it forwards uh, you know, the, um, the data up, uh, upstream or to the higher layers in the stack. So that's one of the advantages of having the critical bit, but um, um, and that has been clarified, uh, or if if it is not clarified, we will add additional text in order to clarify this information. And the other um, recommendation uh, is to increase the single TLV option to 256. Um, um, this is this one was specifically for a telemetry use case, and this was discussed uh, during the previous uh, roundtable as well as during the working group uh, meeting after the roundtable. Um, and there was no consensus regarding this use case. There were multiple discussions happening at this point. Um, for completeness sake, so we wanted to bring this up here um, so that the working group has an opportunity to look at that and, and comment on this one. And based on that, uh, you know, uh, we will uh, go ahead and make any changes if needed. Uh, but uh, one point I would like to state that one is that also means that it will limit uh, the options that can be carried in Geneva. And we believe that there will be at least some other options that will be available. And so in case of a telemetry, um, uh, if telemetry option takes away the entire space, um, then um, it, it's going to be difficult for carrying other options. And also, in you know, one of the uh, examples that was quoted is the P4 INT, which is uh, specifying uh, an example uh, use case of how to carry the telemetry, and 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 that same uh, document mentions about how you can carry uh, split the um, you know information into two different options to carry it over uh, Geneva. Um, so that's another example I can I, I can quote you. So the, um, as I said, right, this requires further discussion before we effect any any change to the draft. And next slide, please. So um, okay. 
after uh, you know some of these information has been captured as i mentioned in the design team draft and then we have been closely coordinating with the design team to make sure that uh, you know we capture all those points when we uh, make make a draft update on geneve and uh, even after the design team draft was published um, further discussions were on the uh, uh, mailing list and we are closely observing that one and based on uh, how the discussion progresses uh, we will make the necessary update as appropriate with that um, Thank you. That's the update I had. And um, any questions, comments? OK. No. Well, thanks very much, Arango. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so next is the security requirements. Daniel. Hi, so I'm going to go through uh, some of the security requirements we've foreseen for Geneva. We have 10 minutes. So, um, well, over, is that a very old presentation? Well, so, well, we will present four drafts, um, and this is the requirement draft. So then we will go into the solution space where we will describe. Um, how the protection is actually instantiated, and then how these different solutions are coordinated. So that's a security architecture. So the requirement. So as you can see, um, we have NVE, and then we have some um, Geneva forwarding elements. So the packet has to go from one tenant through the NVE, so the different um, forwarding elements back to um, a tenant system somewhere else. So the Geneva overlay is really between the tenant and the infrastructure. So it has different goals. One of those is as Gen um, the Geneva overlay is managing the different tenants. So it has to isolate each of the tenants and make sure traffic is not mixing between the different uh, virtual networks. And it also has to protect um, all this traffic from the infrastructure which can be seen as a different entity. And also the overlay network has to be quite robust. So these are the three goals. Uh, tenant isolation, so you want to avoid that some traffic goes into one virtual network. Um, you want to prevent that some traffic that leaks outside um, the virtual networks be analyzed and then re-inject. Um, and you want also maybe to provide a, an additional service to the tenants, which is where will protect your traffic to an infrastructure um, we might not trust. Um, then the overlay network um, should be robust, which means um, robust against uh, replay attacks. And um, yeah, against uh, traffic modifications. And uh, of course, well, we should be protecting the traffic against the infrastructure. So, um, the first thing is that tenants might encrypt um, their communications using IPsec, for example. Well, in this case, um, it won't be part of Geneva, the Geneva overlay, to provide some of the protections. In, in that case, uh, the tenants are somehow providing some of the ways. but. Um, to protect um, their communications, um, so it, this is not in the this is not in the scope of Geneva to provide an IPsec tunneling uh, between the different tenants. That's really the scope of the tenants. Um, so, well, what we considered is mostly that any nodes can be performing an attack, like injecting injecting some traffic. And uh, that any nodes on path must be able to read the Geneva header, and uh, the destination must be able to authenticate the incoming packets. So that's how we base the analysis on. So here is the, some of the requirements we went to in, in order to avoid traffic injections. So when, you, when you're evolving within a virtual network, 
you don't want actually any packets going well illegitimate illegitimate packets going to your virtual network so the first requirement is a, a Geneva NVE must be able to authenticate the Geneva header including the immutable Geneva options this means that um, a Geneva packet where you have a switch one bit in the NVEI won't be able to reach the modified target, for example. But that's, of course, not enough. So we went to a Geneva NVE must be able to agree that the authentication also includes some of the options. Of course, the options has, do not change. And it should be also include um, some parts of the Geneva payload. So the reason we think it's not always, it doesn't always need to include um, the Geneva payload is, for example, if you only want to uh, authenticate a single Geneva option. So in that case, the payload is not involved. But um, the, other th the other reason we don't want to, well, we may not want to include the full Geneva payload is that um, during the um, Chicago session, we've been told that it would take too much resource to include the world payload. And uh, for example, if the traffic is protected with TLS or DTLS or IPsec, then you can uh, lower the need for resource by limiting the, the amount of data you encrypt. So that's some, some of the reason. Then, um, we also mentioned that, well, requirement three is um, that a Geneva intermediary forwarding element may be able to validate the authentication before the packet reach the NVE. It clearly means that if it's well provisioned, um, encryption or authentication and uh, validation can be done outside the NVE, for example. And um, that when a um, an inter intermediary forwarding element wants to include an authenticated Geneva option if you would be able to do so. I don't know if there are any comments or remark, but I think you feel free to jump on the mic. So some next requirements. Um, well, we would like to, that even though some Geneva packets are um, authenticated, <coughs> Um, nodes, forwarding nodes that are not supporting that authentication option or validation uh, can still work and forward the different Geneva packets through the data center. Um, requirement six, so we have split that one um, in two different uh, requirements. Um, you should be able to apply different type of security to the different flow you have. And then the big question is how you characterize the flow. And well, the, we assumed or we required that uh, you should be able to describe the flow from the Geneva clear text packet, which includes the Geneva fixed header, the options, and eventually some part of the payloads, the Geneva payloads. The reason to include uh, some part of the Geneva payloads is still if you already have some kind of protections, so you might be able willing to say, well, I'm not going to encrypt the same way a payload that is not protected at all. Um, and um, well, the protection is going to be different from uh, one payload which is already protected with IPsec or TLS. So that was for traffic injection, and now. Um, we have some different, um, if we, we consider the redirections, it starts with, well, a leak of some of the traffic and then the traffic is being re-injected. It could be modified or not. Um, so re-injection is mostly the same as uh, injection, um, but, and leakage is a little bit hard to, well, it's hard on a protocol um, to, to provide some requirement, protocol requirements to avoid leakage. It's mo mostly part of uh, how you deploy the Geneva. So instead, what we focus on 
is how, if you can't prevent leakage, is how you can make um, leakage um, useless by not revealing any kind of information. So even though you have um, IPsec packets, uh, e even though the, the tenants are performing IPsec, for example, you still reveal some information. Um, so like the MAC IP addresses used, the different IP, MAC addresses, uh, the different IP addresses, and if you use TLS, then you reveal also some of the ports, and well, that's still information. Um, so this is why we still need to provide, I mean, uh, you, the use of IPsec by the tenants is not sufficient. So what we put as a requirement is that a GNV NVE must be able to agree that a GNV payload or portion of it is encrypted. And this includes uh, GNV options that are not intended to be uh, updated. Um, requirement nine is a um, a GNV intermediary forwarding element must be able to insert an encrypted GNV options. And then, well, forwarding elements that do not perform encryption or that are not encryption or decryption aware should be able to process the packet anyway. So do we have any comment, suggestion so far? Any strong disagreement? Uh, is this the end of the uh, presentation or? No, but you can. So I'll, uh, I'll wait a couple of minutes. Okay. So now, now that we, well, we worked on, um, well, we, we have only addressed uh, how to isolate the, the tenants uh, from um, an attacker. So now the second part is how we can make the overly uh, robust itself. So. Well, the, the type of attacks we consider at that level is um, um, an attacker that is replaying some traffic. So he can sometimes modify the, the header, but even though he's not modifying the header, if you replace um, an OIM traffic, well, usually you, you've designed the, um, your networks for a given amount of traffic on each category. So. If you're increasing the volumetry on OAM traffic, for example, you can you might disrupt the network or um, so on. So, or if you're adding options, it's changed the way you're engineering your network. So, the basically the two requirements we came to is um, to have um, anti-replay mechanisms and. Um, and well, to, can you speed up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, the other thing is that, well, we should have a binding, ma make it possible to bind the payload with the header, because if you have a header that is perfectly protected and a payload that is pr perfectly protected, you replay that overall. You can change one or the other. Um, so both have to be protected and bound together. Isolation. Well. Isolation is mostly encryption, so uh, as has been explained in um, how to protect uh, the tennis traffic from leakage. I think so. Question? Tom is Rahim or Vel. Um, so first of all, thanks for putting together this draft. Um, one thing that was missing for me to understand the entire picture uh, was the threat analysis. Um, to understand the set of threats that we're trying to deal with, the set of uh, attack vectors, and then maybe to have kind of a mapping between requirements and attacks, uh, because this was, would allow us to understand uh, the priority of the requirements and um, okay. to make sure we haven't forgotten in any attacks or just to make sure that everything uh, fits together. Okay, so um, are you, also suggesting that from the draft or yes on the, okay so yeah um, yeah we can discuss that we we should improve that um, I thought I had done it so maybe we can discuss that then okay. of course that's things that has to be done thanks
Hi, Suresh Krishnan. Yeah, thanks for putting it together. Um, I had like a couple of questions. Like, first of first of all, on the the requirement stuff, right? Um, I would like to see some kind of description on like why just encrypting the UDP payload is not sufficient, right? And what's the advantages and disadvantages doing that, right? So encrypting the UDP outer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like that gives you like some benefits and some disadvantages. So like you know that would yeah. be something that's good to have. And the uh, second thing is. Um, uh, just one comment about this question. I think we we address this comment. Why not taking the outer um, in the solution space? But maybe we should include it in the requirements then. Okay, sounds good. And and the other thing is like the document structure is a bit hard to handle. So this has the exact same document structure as IPsec, pretty much, right? So there's an architecture yeah. and. Um, I think it's a bit too heavyweight for this, right? Like so, and they're like pretty simple documents. The crypto suites are somewhere else. So like, maybe we don't need all that complexity to keep all these things separate. Maybe um, one document could cover the architecture and the options together, right? Like because, oh, yeah. right? Like so, um, the requirements being separate is fine, right? So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. If we can come with any, I mean, uh, something that can be put in one draft, it's of course no problem. Right, and it is simple enough at this point to do it, right? Like, and yeah. if it becomes complex, maybe it's worth splitting out. But right now, um, I think it's the right thing to do. Okay, thank you. So um, I don't know how much time do we have. We ten, are ten minutes. Yeah, oh. So I should do the short version of that. Yes. Okay. So well. On the slides, well, we we had a we started with a discussion um, on. Basically, why the current DTLS solution and why the current IPsec solution does not fill exactly the requirements, and also why we need to find out um, a specific a solution that is specific to Geneva. So I'm going to skip the slides, but I'm happy to got um, some questions. Um, so, as mentioned before, well, b basically what we are doing is an uh, well, it has a strong IPsec flavor. Um, and we use um, the anti-replay, the authentications. Well, this is, Gao is the Genevi authentication option. Um, so we use IPsec AH for that, and uh, we adapted those for um, Genevi. Um, so it enables the authentication of this, the, the fixed header the options, a subset of the options. Um, we believe it does not impact um, um, forwarding nodes that are not aware of these options. And um, uh, it also enables um, uh, someone in the past to insert um, an authenticator options or to insert an options on an authenticated packet. So this is, so it looks very much, well, this is a Genevi option which looks pretty much like um, the IPsec uh, AH option. The only difference is that um, the ID used in IPsec is called the SPI, and it's uh, 32 bits long. But in our case, because it's based on the NVE, maybe a shorter size is sufficient. And the other thing we added is clearly that we use the uh, covered length which is in um, AH by default, the full packet. Um, so this is how it works. We have the Genevi fixed header, some Genevi options that are not covered. And then we indicate that from that point, with the, the Gao option, we just indicate from that point up to um, the covered length, this is going to be authenticated. So things that are um, outside the covered length are not authenticated. And thing uh, before the GAO, between the GAO and the Geneva header are not authenticated either. Um, so the, well, I think in the design, the, the advent, one of the advantages of doing so is that when you see the packet, you know exactly what is going to be authenticated and which options is going to be authenticated and which are that are not going to be authenticated. And you also have to cover that so you can process the packet um, as that. Well, the processing is very much like the IPsec, so I'm going uh, quite fast. Well, 
the encryption option. So it's really like the IPsec um, as well, ESP. Um, one of the differences is that um, usually in ESP, you include the encrypted packet into that option. But Geneva options have some limited size, so we basically adopted the same design as for the authentication, which is we put a marker, the authentic Geneva authenticator option that says, from here, we are authenticating this cover length, uh, encrypting this cover length of amount of data. And um, the signature is in the, um, the, um, the option itself. So that's not an issue problem. So basically, you will have the fixed header, the Geneva option that are not protected, then the, the encryption option that says from here is it is encrypted. You have the cover lens with cover, so which is the encrypted payload. So you have to decrypt that, remove the options, and then you're back to normal. Um, the, another thing we change is that the, we usually use uh, authenticated encryption. So, and in our case, um, the Geneva fix header is also authenticated, so we can bind the packets together, the two parts of the packets. So we will see another proposal uh, later, and uh, you, we will be also to compare those uh, two proposals, but we are happy to see any, any comments on that. I think that's okay. fine for this one. So we've described on how to authenticate some packets um, in various conditions. We have described how to encrypt some packets. The two options can be combined together. Uh, now we need to be able to orchestrate all these options together according to flows. So this is really the purpose of the security as architecture. To, from one flow to be able to associate the right security options and then when you receive the packet, to be able to decrypt, validate this, uh, this protected packets. And then, which is important, to make sure that the resulting clear text packet match the security policies. So it looks complex. It's not so much complex, but it's still IPsec. So, the model we had is you have Geneva and you have the, what we call the Geneva security model. So you have a clear text Geneva packet. It is processed, protected. Then the receiver got a protected Geneva packet. You process that and give back a, a clear text packet. Um, so, well, the policies are um, you, when you have received a clear text Geneva packet, you, you, you need to know if it, it, you have to discard it to bypass that way, so, which means not protect it or to protect it. Um, when you have to protect it, you need to have some security material ready. So that's what we call the security association. So the policies say, do you have to secure it? How to secure it? That's a security association. So the big question is um, how we would define a packet needs to be protected or not. So we use what we call traffic selector because we have to read from the packet what needs to be, well, which, if the packet needs to be protected or not. And so we are listing a few fields. So the fields include the fields of the uh, Geneva header as well as uh, some inner, uh, some fields of the inner packet. The real question is, um, currently, I think we have been a little bit exhaustive, but a, a field should be mentioned if it makes sense to say, OK, according to this field, we might need different security policies. If, for example, I'm just taking uh, the example of the first field, the Geneva version. If it makes no sense to say, well, if this is version 1, I'm going to use this security policy, while if it's version two, I'm going to use this one. If we don't have this kind of um, um, distinction, then 
uh, the field should not exist. If it, so, so at that point, well, if you have any, we can reduce the, the number of fields. Currently, I just added those, uh, and we'll see. <coughs> so we have some additional selectors. We, on, do, we do not only um, proceed to a given security policy according to the fields of the Genevi header, but it's also according to the nature of the, the payload, uh, the Genevi payload, which is the packet sent by the tenant. Um, so, well, you need the next, if you want to make some distinctions between DTLS, TLS, uh, IPsec uh, traffic from the tenant, that you need the next header and the port and uh, these additional uh, selectors. So if that's too complex or if it's not enough, uh, well, it's time to say it. Um, well, outbound processing, so basically you receive the packet according to the traffic selectors you have designed, which uh, that is the security policy. You mentioned, okay, this packet has to be pro protected. Then you apply the different um, security options. Uh, which means that currently what we foreseen is that in a control environment, you will provide the security policies and the security associations. So, which means the cryptographic material necessary for the security. Uh, but then in the next step, we will also be able to um, use IV2 so you can have a negotiation between the different NVE and have something a little bit more autonomous or less controlled. Or when you have an inbound processing, so I will go fast on that slide, but the only thing I want to, well, the reason we need that security architecture is not that we want to make things complex, but uh, if you receive a packet and you can't validate the signature, it's fine. But uh, actually, then you need to actually check uh, whether the corresponding security match the policies, because suppose you want to secure the ping, and, 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 and I'm sending you an HTTP packet. When I receive the packet, I don't know if it's a ping or uh, HTTP. So I'm gonna decrypt that. I say, well, fine, it's a good packet. But then I realize it's an HTTP and not a ping. So I have to, to, to double check the security policy and says, well, it is not what I intended to. So I have to reject. So that's basically the scope of the security architecture. Um, TLS does not make it simpler. It's just because it's a different model TLS is being used. Um, but that's the reason we need a, a security architecture. Any question or welcome? And I think I didn't take too much time. <laughs> okay, so, so any questions? Let me just say okay, here, it's not a question. Daniel, it's a Genel, right? Not Geneva. Oh, it's not. How do you pronounce that? <laughs> do we have a Geneva author in the room? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think next is Sammy. Yeah, if you haven't signed the blue sheet, uh, I think they're coming around again. Can you put your hand up if you haven't signed the blue sheet, please? Yeah, there's a few to the, towards the back, if you just pass it backwards. Uh, this draft is a proposal on how to carry uh, IPsec over Geneva. Uh, IPsec defined two protocols here, which are the encaps encapsulation security payload, or ESP, uh, as well as uh, authentication header, or AH. Those are two different IP protocol type, 50 and 51. So um, here we are going to be discussing how can we carry those protocols as next protocols over Geneva. So this is uh, the frame format here for carrying ESP 
uh, over a Genève tunnel. So uh, we have shown here um, the outer IP and the outer Ethernet header, uh, of course, the UDP port for Genève, uh, or the UDP uh, header, uh, followed by the Genève header. The next protocol in Genève will be uh, 50, which is ESP. Uh, then we have the options, then we have the ESP header, uh, and then the inner uh, uh, payload. Uh, of course, given that the inner payload is uh, could be layer two, uh, uh, then uh, we need uh, to have an I, uh, another uh, header to carry the layer two if it's if the inner payload is going to be layer two, uh, which most most likely be the case here. Uh, and this is why we need uh, an Ether IP header uh, of two bytes or GRE header of four bytes. Uh, than uh, the inner layer two packet, of course, the ESP trailer and the IS ICV. Uh, so I've shown here uh, the part that will be uh, encrypted uh, uh, is going to be the inner packet, uh, starting from the, uh, after the ESP header to the trailer, to the end of the trailer. Uh, and of course, the authentication or the integrity uh, will include as well the ESP header. Uh, the ESP header next protocol uh, could be Ether IP, as I mentioned, or GRE, and those are uh, IP protocol. Uh, and the GRE protocol type, of course, uh, uh, here will be set to Ethernet if we are going to be carrying Ethernet. So this is um, how can we carry uh, ESP uh, or protocol 50 over Geneva. Uh, the next slide here is uh, uh, for the AH. And the H again is another IP protocol of uh, type 51. Uh, and in here, same uh, same idea, uh, is that the outer uh, IP header, we have the outer IP header uh, for the Geneve tunnel. Then the UDP port again, uh, or the UDP header uh, was the port equal Geneve. And then the Geneve header next protocol is gonna be 51. Then we have the option TLVs, the uh, authentication header of the H, IPsec H. Uh, then again the GRE and the inner uh, payload. Uh, in here, what's being authenticated include the outer tunnel header. Uh, uh, of course, except for what's defined under IPsec AH as mutable, mutable fields. Uh, those are the fields that are not being that are not included in the authentication. So in here, the idea is that some of the option TLVs could be included uh, uh, in the authentication, while other could not be. Uh, and that will depend on uh, the control plane associated with that option TLV as we are defining them. So, so one can envision that some of the option TLV could be inserted by midpoint, and those uh, will not be authenticated by uh, the H here. They could be authenticated by, uh, by other mechanisms, but not by the H. So H, uh, as by the definition with IPsec H, uh, only authenticate the non-mutable fields, right? Uh, here, uh, the control plane consideration is the draft. We are talking about, um, uh, you know, we are definitely you are envisioning that there will be a control plane between the NVEs, uh, whether centralized or, or distributed, that are going to be negotiating or signaling that the next protocol carried by Geneve will be ASP or H. Uh, so now the endpoint will know uh, that uh, the Geneve tunnel will be carrying uh, the IPsec, ESP, or H. Uh, as well as that control plane, uh, as mentioned in the other presentation, can be uh, uh, used to signal as well what kind of option uh, we are going to be carrying on the Geneve tunnel. Uh, so once the two NVEs agrees that they have to carry SP or H uh, as next protocol, then this could, could be uh, a trigger uh, for negotiating the security association, right, uh, that can be used here. Uh, and establishing uh, uh, the SA or the secure association. Uh, and same thing, mechanisms uh, defined in IPsec uh, can, can simply be used here as well to do the key exchange. So, uh, so this is leveraging uh, what exists in IPsec to uh, do the secure association uh, and as well to, uh, to set up, I mean, uh, establish the secure association and as well to negotiate the keys. Uh, and whatever can be carried again over those secure association, uh, uh, whether this is going to be policy based or routed, meaning we can route some uh, packet uh, over that secure association, can simply be used to, right? So, uh, this, 
I think that's it. So, uh, you know, in terms of next steps, definitely would like to get comments more from the list. Yeah, but just so can, again, just to break the ice, can this not be used uh, with VXLAN? Uh, VXLAN doesn't carry an X protocol today, right? VXLAN uh, does not have the next protocol to carry ESP or carry any IP or Ethernet protocol, unlike Geneva or other encaps that are defined. Okay, you network. can encapsulate within IPsec AH we, or whatever. Uh, here, here we are talking about carrying ESP over uh, Geneva, right? Because Geneva has an X protocol on which you can specify uh, that I'm carrying ESP or carrying AH or carrying whatever, right? While VXLAN uh, only have VNI, does not have an X protocol on it. So you cannot carry uh, uh, ESP over VXLAN. You can use ESP before VXLAN, before the UDP, and encrypt the whole packet. So, so that's another option. I think here the draft is about carrying ESP over Gini, not, not uh, using ESP to encrypt uh, uh, the whole payload of IP tunnel that can include the UDP and the ESP as well. Okay, Andrew, thank you. Okay, no problem. UDP and, and Geneva, sorry, or VXNF. Hi, Tom is Rahim or Vel. Um, so I hope there are IPsec experts here who can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I believe that at some point uh, AH was deprecated and uh, the IPsec me, uh, no. At some point there was a recommendation to use um, ESP with null encryption instead of AH. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's a it's a debate that comes um, I, every uh, two or three years, uh, but it's AH is there. Well, we we have we have a draft on the, at, at the ISG that is providing recommendations on how to protect the AH. So, stand okay. corrected. Okay, thanks. Any more comments? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So um, next is Jorge. I can't. Is he there? Yeah. Good afternoon. So the uh, the chairs have asked me to present a little bit of uh, what we've do been doing in BES uh, for data centers or for DC overlay networks. So this is my own view from a participant's um, perspective. So uh, I want to talk about uh, eVPN uh, briefly in uh, just one, two slides. Then uh, I wanted to touch based on the, the, the work we've been doing in BES for MVO3 networks. A little bit of EVPN in the industry today, and finally uh, an open discussion about what what else we need to do um, uh, in BES for MVO3. So EVPN in a nutshell: if um, what is EVPN, Ethernet uh, Virtual Private Networks? So it's basically specified in RFC 7432, and uh, it's basically uh, the original idea was to have a, a multi-point layer two VPN operate it as we do with IPVPNs, right? Where the, the MAC addresses and all the information you need to set up flooding trees uh, is distributed by multi-protocol BGP. The main objectives in uh, RFC 7432 were first to replace the old flood and learn behavior that we have in traditional ethernet networks uh, with BGP, right? So we want to uh, distribute MAC addresses in uh, with BGP, and that is actually uh, giving you a lot of control, control that can, you can use to detect things like uh, MAC duplication or uh, things like MAC protection, or allows you to to have a, a very quick uh, MAC mobility, right? So it, it makes it a perfect technology for the data center. The other objective was to have an efficient way to uh, to deliver multi-destination traffic or bump traffic. And the other key uh, feature in EVPN in 7432 was multi-homing. So uh, EVPN supports not only single active multi-homing, but all active multi-homing, which was really uh, probably the, the first um, standard-based technology supporting this. 
So since 7.4.3.2, eVPN has evolved uh, quite a bit, and uh, there are a lot of uh, drafts and documents that uh, explain the evolution of eVPN. It's now a unified control plane uh, technology that allows you to have pretty much all the services you need. So eLAN, eLine, e3, but also layer three services and, uh, and cloud DCI services. Uh, the good thing about eVPN is it's pretty flexible. You can extend it. It's transport agnostic, so you can use it with any tunnel. And it has a lot of advanced features already there. So uh, if you had to explain what eVPN 7432 is in just one slide, uh, you could think about it uh, like this. It's actually a, a VPN that you define in a bunch of P's in the network. The instantiation of a VPN in a P is called uh, MacVerve. The a group of MacVerves for the same VPN is an EVI. So an EVPN instance. And then within an EVPN instance, you can have one or multiple broadcast domains, right? And each broadcast domain, if you have multiple, basically is uh, identified by an Ethernet tag in the control plane. Now, more um, characteristics of EVPN. So obviously, uh, uh, connected to those uh, P's, uh, the uh, attachment circuits, you can have customer edge devices, uh, you can have hosts, you can have VMs, you can have routers, switches. The, the MAC addresses that you learn on those attachment circuits uh, can be uh, learned dynamically, statically, through the management plane, so there's no limitation there. But then, whatever you, you learn at the access, you can actually distribute in multi-protocol BGP using MAC IP routes. Those MAC IP routes they uh, encode the MAC and IP information of the attached uh, hosts, and, uh, and those are advertised along uh, with a label and a BGP next stop. Now, the tunnels that you have among all the P's that are part of the same EVI uh, can be anything. can be MPLS tunnels, including point to multi point for bump traffic. Uh, we also support, like, PVB encapsulation over MPLS tunnel, that's what we call PVB EVPN. But we also support MVO3 uh, tunnels, right? And uh, nowadays, the, um, the the most popular option is, of course, VXLAN. Um, finally, one of the key features in EVPN is multi-homing. Uh, single active multi-homing, which means per VLAN load balancing from SE to a group of P's. And uh, if you have single active multi homing, there are also nice features like mass withdrawal that allows you to have a uniform failover, irrespective of the number of MAC verbs that you have in an internal segment. But especially uh, something very appealing is the, the all active multi homing. So that is the ability of having a per flow load balancing from a given CE to a group of uh, P's that are part of the same Ethernet segment. Um, Along with uh, this all active multi homing, uh, where you allow the, uh, this per flow load balancing from the CE to the, to the network, uh, we have this aliasing function that is providing the same per flow load balancing from a remote P to all the P's in the Ethernet segment. So this is pretty much 7432. Um, but as I said before, uh, since 7432, uh, EVP has evolved a lot. So we have a lot of documents. And uh, here you have uh, some of the most uh, relevant documents we have for eVPN. Um, above the dashed line, uh, you have a bunch of uh, documents. Some of them are RFCs. Some others are already uh, drafts in last call. And uh, they, they pretty much define all the, uh, the services that, uh, that you need. And some of them are specific to the use case of the data center and the, the DCI, right? Uh, specifically, you have uh, here uh, the uh, eVPN overlay draft that talks about how to use eVPN for uh, overlay tunnels like VXLAN, MVGRE. Uh, you have uh, the DCI eVPN overlay draft that talks about how to connect uh, overlay data centers to a WAN. And uh, you even have the intercept forwarding in, in the prefix advertisement draft talking about how to provide intercept forwarding using eVPN. 
Uh, but not only that, so uh, below the dashed line, you have uh, many more documents uh, extending the, uh, the feature set of eVPN. And if you look at the website, the, uh, the best tracker, you'll find uh, more than 20 individual eVPN related drafts. So it's a, it's a very active and, um, and dynamic technology. We keep expanding it. So why is eVPN used in uh, data centers? So you, you can have the base uh, specification in the eVPN overlay draft, but the idea is that uh, modern data centers are based on a class-based architecture and IP fabrics, right? So it's all uh, IP, all the links are routed. And, uh, and on top of that, you need uh, multi-tenancy with intra and inter subnet forwarding, right? And uh, obviously, in order to, to have layer two and layer three on top of this IP fabric, you need IP overlay tunnels. And uh, nowadays, VXLAN, as I said before, is the, the most popular option. Why do we need a control plane for uh, VXLAN or any other IP overlay tunnel? Well, first of all, you need to auto discover uh, the remote VTEPs. So when a given VM in a subnet uh, needs to talk some, to someone else in a different uh, leaf or or data center gateway. It uh, needs to know how to 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 reach that uh, leaf or data center gateway, right? The other thing you need is to somehow distribute the MAC and IP information of the different hosts in your subnets, and you also need some uh, more advanced options. So uh, eVPN is a perfect fit for the data center for the um, an MVO uh, data center. So it provides all the basic control plane needs that you have. Uh, and as an example here, you have uh, two leaves, right, with uh, a VM attached to each of them, and then you have a data center. So you have the same subnet uh, for a tenant uh, configured in the three of them. Uh, the inclusive multicast ether tag route, which is one of the eVPN route types, is providing you with this auto discovery function. So the two leaves can send this inclusive multicast route and the uh, data center gateway can actually learn that those two uh, VTEPs uh, are associated to VNI1 and they are part of the same flooding list. But not only that, but uh, when the two leaves, they, uh, they learn the MAC and IP addresses of the uh, VMs, they can actually advertise MAC IP routes with that information along with the VTEP, the associated VTEP and VNI. So the, the remote node is going to add that information to the forwarding database and also to the, the art table, et cetera. You can also do advanced things with eVPN like inter subnet forwarding. So if the same tenant has a different subnet, a red subnet, which is not defined in all the MVEs, you can use eVPN with special route type to propagate or to advertise prefixes, right? And to, ins to install those prefixes in a in an IP routing table. And you have other things that you can do with eVPN. You have some examples here in the slide. Now, uh, eVPN in the industry today, so it's, it's not only a, a lab exercise or a scientific paper, it's actually deployed widely everywhere so um, in, you have multiple implementations, hardware-based, software-based, and the proof that we are doing a great job in the IETF is that uh, actually it's uh, EVPN interoperates across different vendors, right? And uh, here you have an example. Um, so we do every year this uh, interoperability uh, event uh, run by the uh, EANTC, and uh, for two or three years now, we are testing eVPN across different vendors. And uh, we are testing very interesting scenarios and, uh, and very, uh, I would say, in a success, successful way. So that's great news. So eVPN works and it works across different vendors. Now, and this is an open discussion, so what else do we need to do with eVPN for MVO3, for this working group? So obviously, uh, we need to support new uh, encapsulations like Geneve. And there's a first attempt. I think Sami is presenting tomorrow this, this draft about how to, uh, how to use eVPN with uh, Geneve. And uh, I can think of using, we, need, we will need to extend eVPN to support uh, 
new options or extensions. And, uh, and I don't know what else, but uh, this is probably a, an open discussion and, and question from, so for the chairs. So any, any um, comments or feedback on those questions? Can, can you go to the mic, please? Maybe I missed it. Did you cover the band connectivity or that's a future use case? WAN connectivity? Yeah. Yeah, so we have a draft in last call in BES. It's called uh, DCI eVPN overlay talks about uh, DCI for uh, DC overlay networks, yeah? Using eVPN, yes. Okay, so I think there were a couple of couple of reasons. Uh, thank, thank you, Hargo, for, for that presentation. Um, why, why we asked to have an overview of, of what was going on in, in BEST for, for eVPN um, in MVO3 was partly to get some idea. So it's, it, you know, it's an applicable control plane for MVO3, although working on eVPN isn't isn't necessarily in our scope. Um, so there's definitely a kind of a discussion about whether or not we some, need some kind of applicability RFC or something in in MVO3 to point to point to this work um, and to show how you know how it fits with with the MVO3 architecture. The second issue, I guess, is yes, are there new require are there requirements that we are generating? In MVO3 that we can input into the work in BES for the evolution of, of eVPN to support our requirements, which which is so um, yeah. If you don't have any any thoughts now, but any feedback on the list would be would be great. Yeah. So follow the work, the solution work in the BES working group, and uh, the applicability document will be generated from this working group. I think that's a clarification. Like. Okay. Cool. All right. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So next is um, the 802.1 QCN update. Uh, okay, this is Yi Zhou Li. I'm going to give um, a quick update on this IEEE 802.1 QC, which is the VDP extension for MVO3 as per the uh, requirement document from the MVO3 working group. Next slide. Yeah, this is a background. Uh, so we have started this project as per this control uh, split MVE control plane requirement document and the draft 0 0.4 is available at this link and the password is available next page. So I'm, uh, next slide please. So I'm go going to give some summary on, on the progress of this project. Um, we have received both the technical and the editorial comments from the MVO3 mailing list on the most recent draft 0 0.4. So thank you for all the reviewers. And last week we held, we had the IEEE 802 plenary meeting. Um, and in that meeting we have, the comments have, have been resolved. Uh, basically, we found nothing controversial. So the current revision, we think, basically meets the needs for the split control plane uh, requirements. And we'll, we're going to update it to the draft 0 0.6 as per the uh, comments resolution. So the comment disposition is available at the following link. And uh, uh, it, it requires the password. So it's the same as those of the drafts. You may also contact the uh, uh, chairs for the password and the reviewers. So please try to find uh, this comment disposition and uh, you may talk to me uh, on what your opinions. Okay, one more thing is because the QC in which is the standard number uh, has the ambiguity because uh, IEEE has another project called QCN with the name quantized congestion notification. So we are we are going to change the standard number QCN to some other numbers, but with the same title, it's still called a v, uh, VDP extension for MVO3. So don't be too surprised if we change the number later. Uh, next page. Uh, 
So basically what we are going to do is for the, on the uh, IEEE 8021, we are going to prepare the new document, draft 0 0.6, and going to start a working group ballot on it. And at the ETF ML3 side, we are going to request a working group last call on the requirement documents after this QCN draft 0 0.6 is ready. So this is the update. Any questions? Okay, I guess that's Okay, true. thank you. Okay, so next. Um, next to Dehan. Huh? Hello everyone, I'm Lu Huang from China Mobile, and uh, <clears throat> I will present a VXLAN GP extension uh, for CU separated uh, uh, VBNG. And actually, I presented uh, our requirement and uh, list some solution in Chicago meeting. And uh, this time, I will uh, quickly review the requirement and uh, uh, describe uh, our choice on, on the solution. Uh, uh, firstly, our problem is uh, um, we are uh, we are introduce uh, we are introduce a new architecture of uh, BNG in our network. Uh, um, compared to traditional BNG, we separate BNG control plan and user plan uh, in in uh, into two parts. Uh, we will deploy control plan in a centralized site and. Uh, uh, distribute uh, user plan as needed. Uh, so between control plan and user plan, uh, there were several interface uh, for uh, for CP and UP to exchange uh, necessary information. One of the interface is service interface. This interface is for the uh, PPOE or IPOE authentication packet exchange between CP and UP. And we choose VXLAN as the uh, encapsulation protocol uh, to uh, for for the for the package and uh, because um, and in our network uh, most of uh, device can support VXLAN, uh, but furthermore we need uh, uh, we need the user access port information um, and be carried in VXLAN header, uh, so this part is not uh, is not standardized. Uh, in any in any existing um, uh, document, the port information include uh, device ID, slot ID, subcard ID, and uh, port ID. Uh, so we um, so we are uh, uh, we extend the VXLAN GPE header to meet the requirement uh, because we think this way is uh, um, it's more flexible uh, and uh, not so complex. And um, as the diagram show, um, uh, we request a new next hope in VXLAN GPE header for VBNG service header. Um, and we define a, a VBNG service header uh, to carry uh, the port information. Um, there, uh, there are a flag next protocol and the node ID, slot ID, sub subcard ID, port ID, and port type. Um, and also, uh, there's another optional format for the port information, uh, which is interface index. Uh, it is specified in RFC 2863, and it's a standard way to indicate a port, but uh, this way uh, is not an explicit way to describe a, a port. And uh, uh, we have to uh, we have to build uh, maintain a, a mapping table between interface index and the port information. Uh, so it's relatively a, a, a more uh, complex way, um, but these two way uh, have their advantage and disadvantage. And we hope we can receive some comments on the choice of these two way. Mm. Yeah, Please. just want to supplement. Uh, yeah. Sorry, this is Michael from Huawei, and uh, just as co-author, and I want to uh, explain why we need this 
optional solution because we have uh, discussed with some vendor, uh, discuss, discussing with some operator, and they think maybe uh, the subcar, uh, the subcar ID, slot ID, and the port ID maybe not uh, enough to help to research this node's the location. So maybe need more. Uh, Attributes such as a rock ID, shaffer ID, such as like this. So they requires a method to mapping this different ID uh, to a research way or uh, driving method. So we propose an uh, optional solution to use the interface index to do uh, this job. Okay. Thank you. Um, and. Uh, 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 here is an uh, example of PPO EDAP process. Uh, I hope it's uh, helpful um, uh, for the understanding of the uh, CU separated VBNG, how, how the, the new architecture works. Uh, and uh, I will skip the details, and uh, anyone uh, is, just, is interested in can uh, read the detail in, in, my, in my draft. Mm, and for the next step, um, uh, welcome uh, your comments and suggestions and, uh, and we request uh, for working group adoption. Thank you. Any question? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I think with that, we've um, got five minutes left. Thank, thanks to all the speakers for keeping to their slots. That's great. Um, any any further comments anyone wants to raise? Oh, okay, thank you very much. If anyone hasn't signed the blue sheet there up in the front, please do sign it. A weak response from the author service or Jimmy? From everybody. Or DD or no, from William Brown. They actually Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. One way that maybe is and I will look at the same Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a real way forward. It's one of the reasons we held CC and CB is because it just, just didn't make any sense to move it forward while so many elevated. Uh, yeah, because again, you, you notice there were two issues that we didn't like what we saw last time. <laughs> Finally. Now, what we use question echo so where are the SFC? What's, what's the status of the SFC solutions? Well, we introduced a whole new proposal, uh, quite small, uh, and there are always uh, views of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh,